Hey, 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 everyone. Welcome back to another episode of The In Between. I'm your host, Elizabeth Cheney, and I have a wonderful, exciting guest. I mean, when do I not have wonderful, exciting guests? Hello. So her name is Rosa Castaño. I want to give you a little intro about her before I let her introduce herself. So we were introduced by a past guest, Brittany Tucker. She's brighter with Brit. She was actually like on, not my first guest, but one of my first big guests. Um, we talked about really vulnerable things, uh, domestic violence, an experience she had. And we've been friends since, great, great, great connections. And a little while ago, she reached out and said, hey, I need you to meet this rock star Rosa. She's my friend. I think you guys will click. And click, we did. So Rosa is a meditation, mindfulness, and movement leader, as well as a keynote speaker who offers workplace well-being workshops, stress management workshops, wellness activations, and leadership and development coaching. Basically, she wants you to succeed. She wants you to limit your stress, and she doesn't want the workplace holding you back from any of it. So with a vast corporate history, her unique understanding of stressors and joys of the workplace, it all makes her the ideal expert to help implement strategies and lead workshops to help create resilience and emotional well-being in the workplace, which I think we all crave and need. So what's great about that is you get to hear her now. So Rosa, thank you for joining me and welcome to The In-Between. Happy to be here and thank you so much for that introduction. It's it's so it's so vast <laughs> and covers so much. So I am so happy that Britt introduced us. She's wonderful and I have just, you know, absolutely like new best friend in you. So I'm excited for our chat. I swear, I feel like we were just talking before we started recording, and I was like, gosh, we are very similar. We are so alike, and like, I got to see you. So we're going to make sure that happens at some point in the near future. Please, let's come play in Nashville. Yes, let's sets. And thankfully, Nashville is not, uh, not so far from Atlanta, so I love that. Um, okay, so, Rosa, let's, uh, I'm going to hand you the mic, and I want you to kind of give the audience a little spiel. Tell us about you. Let's, let's get into it before we get into it, if you know what I mean. <laughs> Absolutely. So I always like to kind of start with my origin story. So in 1988, I was born. <laughs> I'm just kidding. We won't go back that far. Ooh, but I do. do like to go back to I was started off my career in the corporate workplace, actually through a family company. My mom owns a company that was around medical equipment sales. And so oh. I really got to cut my teeth on sales immediately, but domestic, international. And my mom was never one to like... You see, you see so much in the you know news right now about Nepo babies. That is not my mom. I think I had to start off cleaning toilets. So she was like, I want you to know every aspect of the business. And I'm like, really? But toilets? Like, I, I get that. Um, but I did. I got, I got to do a warehouse and really worked my way up. And that was kind of what I thought was going to be. Um, you know, my pathway, but then as life does at times, uh, made a little powerful pivot and then decided for my own sake to leave the company, pursue new things. And then I ventured into sales roles, uh, for a company at a Nashville that catered to bachelor and bachelorette parties. I knew oh. I really liked Nashville tourism. So it really, you know, hard, classic transition from medical equipment sales to bachelorette parties. <laughs> Um, but it, <laughs> Sorry, but it was good. one of those things that, no, <laughs> you know, well, the funny thing about it is like, as I, as I, as I thread the story, it, it all kind of like builds on each other where you're like, oh, of course you're kind of doing what you're doing now. So hang, hang tight with me right, <laughs> on this hanging in. journey. Uh, so we, uh, we, I was the first hire for this company. We built the company up. We expanded into Nashville, New Orleans. We attracted the attention of a major network um, that we did a reality TV show. It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. <laughs> Um, and then before the TV show even aired, I just had this little intuitive hit that it was time for me to move on. I didn't think that the show was going to do what everybody hoped it would do. So I kind of followed my intuition and um, I left before that show aired. I got another job um, in tourism and hospitality here in Nashville at a giant music that has to do with country music. So everybody can put two and two together. <laughs> um, and then sure enough, You're TV funny. show airs and... <laughs> Sorry. Thank you. It's, the t it's all the struggles. <laughs> we we laugh so we don't cry, right? Oh, God. I love it. You are my twin. Uh, I'm obsessed. <laughs> God. So, 
sure enough, the TV show really didn't do anything. Um, and so I was able to go on my merry way. But it was uh, it was a very interesting time when it's like you have this TV show airing and then you're at something totally different. But it was a it was a wild year. And then um, 2020. Everybody oh. is familiar with that Wait, lovely did time. Did something happen? There uh, was something I was, going on, right? Something yeah. did happen. <laughs> yeah. So since I was in tourism and hospitality, uh, there was uh, no tourism. And so there was no need for my department. So unfortunately, my department of seven went down to three. My job position was eliminated. OPS, I was five months pregnant. Oh, gosh. So uh, okay. there was a lot of things going on at That's the time. Heart. And yes, luckily, my husband was in a job that uh, thrived during the pandemic. He works for a company that sells... Uh, peaches and other produce and everybody was at home baking and canning and learning how to do stuff That's so right. uh peaches <laughs> thrived during that time so thankfully we were very well taken care of during that but it allowed me to really start going what do i want to do because in the meantime on the side i had done my yoga teacher training i was always very passionate about wellness and well-being but even at that time well-being wasn't a word that was commonly used um, it was really just more wellness, mental health. And then it was kind of one of those things that when my job position was eliminated, I'm like, I get to do whatever I want to do now. Crap. What do I want to do? Because very rarely do we actually get those moments of clarity where we can sit and sit and rest and sit in stillness and just really kind of evaluate life. And because I always knew I wanted to do my own thing, you know, and it was like, okay, in three years, I'll be able to do this. And you, and you have your plan. And then sometimes the universe just burns your boats for you. And that was my, that was my moment to say, okay, what do I want to do? And so I started to search and research and mostly because I saw my friends, my colleagues, peers who were sitting at home by themselves for the first time without the busy schedule by themselves with their own thoughts, which sometimes can be a very scary place yeah. and not necessarily having the tools or the resources or just the knowledge on how to successfully manage those feelings, successfully manage that stress that comes up. And I saw companies, the good ones, wanting to support their employees in that capacity, but also maybe not necessarily knowing how, because mental health still in the workplace was and is, you know, to a degree somewhat very taboo. So whereas originally the workplace is like you come to work or do your job, now the workplace is more seen as this ecosystem that hopefully supports the whole person, not just, um, hey, here's your paycheck, here's your limited insurance, etc. So now there is so much more that's actually expected out of companies, which I think is a good thing because it does allow people to step into roles that they're actually passionate about, leave roles that don't align with them. So I started doing research, seeing this, seeing that there was and this need, and I came across Deloitte, and yeah. I found that's really where the first time I heard uh, or saw the term well-being, that they actually had a chief well-being officer. And I was like, interesting. What? The fact that this company is invested enough to put in their C-suite someone specifically over well-being for their employees and what that entails, I realized that this, this is going to be a trend and one that is so desperately needed. Wow. And not everybody has Deloitte's budget. And so how can I come in and kind of create curriculum, workshops, help to bring tools to people in a very realistic, like meet people where they're at way. So I added on meditation teacher training, and then I added on for my own self as well, mindfulness-based stress reduction, because I, as I evaluated everything, I realized stress is really the undercurrent of what keeps us in that fight or flight. And unmanaged stress keeps us from being able to move forward and heal and create these goals and do the things that we really want to do in life. And so I did mindfulness-based stress reduction as well as specifically also being able to facilitate in the workplace. Oh, that's cool. And so I kind of just, I took all of that and then I took my 15 years from corporate workplace and, and all of my different iterations. And I kind of said, you know, what kind of workshop would I want? What would land with me? And because of my connections in tourism and hospitality, and this is why I always tell people, you know, the best you can don't burn your bridges because that's where I got some of my first clients from were from my you know, many years of networking in that space. And my very first one came from a hotel here, a big hotel chain for their leadership team. 
And I got brought in because I had been brought in by somebody. It's it's just, it's all the ways that people connect. And then you're seeing the thread. Because originally I was brought in to just do a stretch and breathing session for people. Because I was like, that's, that's great. Let me just, let me just connect people that way first. Yeah. And then they loved me and they're like, what do you have that's more? And I was like, yes, I do have more. Um, <laughs> okay. Uh, so, you know, that's how we create things. And that is so true. I remember the first time that I got the connection, made the curriculum, sent it to them, priced it. I laugh because I priced my very first one is at $250 for an hour for 20 people for this leadership team. And um, I, all these, I felt like adults were going in. Cause you know, when sometimes in those rooms, you're like, I'm 15 and why would they listen to me? Even I though am I'm 16. a full grown adult as well. Yeah, I'm a child. I am a oh, child. You're one, year, you're one year older than me. Yeah. I'm a big girl. I'll drive you around, um, but I'm a child. I was, I was, I was going to say, you pick 16 so you can drive. Well, yeah, must be fun. <laughs> Um, but I, I was sitting there kind of having to literally tap into my own practices of, okay, remember to breathe, be where your feet are. So I think I literally pretended to go get pens in a corner and just kind of like hid there for a minute as I did deep breathing, because this was like, this was the moment. And I kind of put my big girl pants on and one of those, like fake it till you make it. And I went through and I led the workshop. It landed with people. It resonated with people. I had such great feedback. And from that moment, it was that spark of this is what I'm supposed to be doing. Mm. Everything else has like been good. It's been fun. It's been great, but this feels aligned. It feels so right. And I was on cloud nine afterwards. And so from there is kind of off to the races, my name getting passed around, being able to help people in, in realistic ways. Cause that's kind of like what I like to hang my hat on is that we see so many social media, um, influencers, personnel out there who are like, I wake up at nine in the morning and then I do my routine and then by 11 and I'm like, please, the average person, especially if they have kids, they're right. up at like five or six and right. then, you know, they're in the office by this. And so how do we actually implement realistic strategies for real people? And so that's what's been the fun part of it all. That is amazing. So that kind of answers your question. Yeah. Long -winded, no, long -story long. <laughs> and honestly, one long-winded, long-story long. No, that was great. And honestly, one thing, like, there's so many things, but one thing to mention this is a great like example of when you sit with yourself and think about what you want to do and then you set out on that journey, things happen. You can't plan it. You can't predict it. I don't know what opportunity is going to come on this path. I don't know when I got to take a left or when I got to take a right, but I'm just going to keep walking and then boom, the left turn comes, the right turn comes, the, the peach pass comes, like whatever the heck. And I just... I love that kind of story uh, just because I'm a big believer in dreams and following your dreams. I know it's really hard as cheesy yeah. as that sounds, but it is so hard to one, like even like listen to yourself, but then two, like follow through and then three, get through the, in the inner narrative imposter syndrome. So I think that's amazing. Yeah, it's definitely an intersection of trust the process, but also inspired action, right? Like I feel like for me, the two have to go hand in hand as much as I would just love and wish that, you know, people would come banging down my door. Unfortunately, they do not. So I have to go out and bang on their doors. But it's one of those things I tell people all the time that, you know, I get questions. How do you get the word out? I'm like, be somewhat obnoxious about telling people what you do and what you want out of what you do, because people can't invite you to the party unless they know you want to come to the party. That is so And we get true. in our own head all the time where we're like, why did they think of me? Or, you know, they should have thought of me. They know, but people are just living their lives. They're doing their own thing. And it's not by any malice of theirs. They're not intentionally leaving you out of things, but it, life gets busy. And so if you're not staying in at top of mind, if you're not showing up to things, if you're not engaging, then unfortunately, you know, there's a tendency where you might drop off. So it's, it's always like, how do you stay um, in with touch points to people? So true. Networking is key. It, it, it is key. And shoot your shot. Like my, my favorite quote that I kind of live by with the podcast, speaking, all the things that I'm trying to do and grow, right? is leap. I, I'm looking up because it's written on my whiteboard. Leap and the net will appear. <laughs> like that is. Yeah. And sometimes the net doesn't appear, but I always just plan that it's going to. And really what I mean by that is when yeah. you make that connection, you or you have that aha moment, lean into it. Like lean into it. 
don't let the imposter syndrome or the second guessing lean into it. Absolutely. So my friends and I have a fun saying amongst ourselves where we say sometimes Delulu is the Salulu, because if you can just go through to have be delusional enough, have the audacity to do it, to try, that's where to me, some of the magic happens 100%. because you're like, you think, and we go, like I said, what a money, one of my keynotes is about fear less because people talk about the fear of failure and I'm like, I, I don't think that's it because fail, everyone's fail, failure's known, so failure is safe and the ego loves to be safe. Where the fear I think gets triggered is the fear of success. So it's that age old adage of, but what if it does work out? How do you have to show up differently? How, what will life look like? What if, what does your life look like when all the things that you've had to complain about or that didn't go your way are all of a sudden gone? Right. That's powerful. And so that's kind of one of the things where you're just, that's where the fear of success comes in. It's like, okay, it's not about removing the fear. It's about noticing it and letting it ride along in the car with you. But you're remembering that you're in the driver's seat because life is full of opportunities to be able to evaluate and level up. But there's times where it's like you said, is there a net? I don't know. Hopefully. (laughs) Hopefully. And I'll tell you right now, spoiler alert, it hasn't let me down yet. So and, and what there I mean by go. that is even an opportunity that didn't pan out or it didn't work out the way I thought it was going to, whatever, let's just say something happens that let me down in a negative feeling, negative emotion, whatever, <laughs> almost immediately there's something else around the corner that I couldn't have predicted, I couldn't have seen. So truly, leap yeah. in the net will appear. Even if it's not for that, it's going to, like, you're going to keep falling. Oh, then it does catch you before you realize, I didn't think I was almost out. So, um Good call out. Very, very, very important too. And it's all easier said than done, but that's why grounding and having good well-being and wellness and stress management helps you because life's hard. We're going to have stress. We're going to get a freaking head. And also not, not yeah. And then also not bypassing the feelings, like have a good shower cry, right? It's just like, (laughs) that's the best time. Pretend like you're in a movie and just like, you know, cry in the show. You just got to get those out sometimes because sometimes it doesn't work out and it's okay to feel sad about it. But it's also the practice of saying, can I hold, can I hold space for both at the same time? Can I be disappointed, but then still optimistic at the same time? You know, it's not bypassing it because we all have feelings. And I think that's where we get in trouble sometimes when we want to push the things down. But it's just going, I'm allowed to be sad about this, but I can't stay sad about it. Right. Don't gaslight yourself. Don't invalidate your feelings, but don't let them c- control your worth. It's momentary. It's like that perfect in between. I love it. I, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, yes, exactly, exactly, yes. Okay, so I just want to say this. The things that we talk about today, they are going to transcend more than just corporate. It will help you with corporate, yes, but it's it's also your day-to-day. It's your personal. These are things that we can do in our day-to-day, but we're going to talk about stress, ways to gauge and manage, and then how we can tackle the larger goals. And one thing that you said to me when we first started talking about this conversation was, you know, survival mode is typically the outcome of like unmanaged stress. So no more survival mode babies. And I know I'm very vocal about mental health, anxiety, stress, my struggles, my issues, you know, well, not issues, but you know what I mean? Like my setbacks and things and hurdles and fight or flight is a real thing. So Mm -hmm. no more survival mode. We are working on grounding ourselves, whether it's in the workplace or in our life. And that's the beauty of it. So You've always been drawn to uh, wellness and well-being. You were a, you said you were a yoga instructor, like you got your certification and then you went into meditation Mm -hmm. and then seeing your friends after, like during the COVID, during the COVID, (laughs) during the pandemic (laughs) and, and seeing the underlying stress tethers. Um, I would be shocked to hear anyone say that their job does not add stress to their life. I mean, we live in America. Let's just be honest. Like job is a part of culture here. It's a part of our life and it makes or breaks if it's not good, it's not healthy, but we can protect ourselves. So my first question for you is how do you think stress impacts us on a personal, like day to day level work, all of it? Oh gosh. So many ways. Um, I always, you know, share touch points of, you know, unmanaged stress taps into emotional, mental, and physical. And it, it's one of those things that it will have a tendency to creep up. There is sometimes where you're like, no, I'm definitely stressed. But the compounding stress is what tends to creep up because we'll ignore it 
And then we're wondering, why can't I sleep at night? Why do I have no appetite? Why do I have too much appetite? Why do I have zero energy? And it's because we're not having that daily self-awareness and that daily check-in, just going, how do I feel today? And then the interesting part is that the body will start to give you little signs, little cues to say, hey, I'm stressed. Hey, you know, my cortisol levels are high. Things are out of whack here. And and that comes in physical ways like clenched jaws is a big oh, sign. That's um, that. The shoulders love to work their way up to the ears, you know, the that furrowing of the eyebrow. Um, me personally, I have a couple of ones that I've noticed for myself where I'll, this sounds really weird and I don't know if anybody else does this, but the only way I can describe it is that like I clench my tongue. Like it's like, I'm constantly flexing with it. Oh my gosh. And I do it's, that. It's not, it's not my, it's not my jaw, but it's like my tongue. And then I'm really, and I'm like, relax. <laughs> I do that. I, I will lock it at the, like the roof of my mouth. It's wild. I don't. Yes. Have- Yes. Okay. Well, I'm glad I'm not the only one. Of course, it would be you that would also resonate with that. that. I I love it. I was like, where is she going to go with this? And when you said that, I was like, shut up. Like, I, because yesterday I was like, so, it was so busy. I was like, the whole day, like my mouth. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Sorry. Continue. And you're like, why is my tongue sore? I didn't even know that my tongue could be sore. And it's because you're, yeah, you're clenching it. And, um, oh my God. and then the other one I noticed, and this is, I am a big fan of like TMI, you're welcome. So we're just going to be like, you know, we're talking about all the stuff. I love it. So I, the other one that I noticed, because we also, um, stress impacts your gut health. So, you know, there, that can have stuff go on for you, but if I'm really stressed and like, for example, if I'm uh, cooking or if I am cleaning the dishes or something, I'll notice that like my butt cheeks are clenched and I'm like, why relax? Right. And you have to like physically relax. And then my brain goes, is this where your tight ass comes from? (laughs) People just like clenching. Right. But it is a sign of stress because it's like your body's holding on to something and you're clenching in different points. So that's why I always like to, I literally have it in my email signature where I'm like, relax the jaw, you know, unfurl the eyebrows because we don't notice unless we do regular check-ins with ourselves where you're like, where am I holding tension? It can be knots in the shoulder blades. It can be headaches. It can, there's all these different components that your body will subtly give you cues and that's your body saying like, hey, get up, move around, step away from your situation. But what ends up happening is that we ignore them and then we start to ignore our basic human needs like drink water, eat, go to the bathroom. It's not so silly to have somebody who's like, oh my gosh, I totally forgot to eat. It's like, yeah, because you're ignoring your hunger cues because you're so deep in it. Or when was the last time you just drank water or looked outside or went to the bathroom? And so when we start to ignore those basic needs, that's when the stress slowly starts to to creep in when we don't give ourselves the opportunities to just get up and step away. And the interesting part is the science behind it is that we only have 45 minutes of focused attention at a time. So beyond that, you're kind of doing yourself a disservice. And I yeah. always joke too, you know, a lot of people wear uh, smart watches and, you know, if you have an Apple watch, it's, it'll say, you know, time to stand up. But how many people are like, nope, ignore. You don't get to right. tell me what to do, you right. machine. And but, but in reality, it's like, you've been sitting for too long. Please stand up. So we get stuck in that L position. When you think about a tree, when you think about the body, everything has to have open channels to flow, to communicate. It's like, oh, it does make sense that I should get up and get out of that bending position and just walk around, take a breath, go do something, reset, and then come back to what I'm doing. But we think instead, no, I'm going to crank out. I just need like three hours of dedicated work. And it's like, yeah, do that. But with a little bit of breaks in between. So I always tell people too, you know, what happens in the workplace directly impacts how we show up in the home life. Yes. What happens in the home life directly impacts how we show up at work. Um, And kind of gone are the days where it's like, you know, leave your stuff at home or leave your stuff at work. And it's the person's responsibility to make sure if they've had that stressful day at work, that they're not coming home and dumping that on their household. Because I know for myself, I'm sure other people can relate to stress 
anxiety that, that just like ugh, it's it's palpable so when somebody yes. walks in the room it's kind of all of a sudden like it shifts the energy of the room and sometimes you can be like oh let's give you know so and so some space because they're obviously not a good mood i did a workshop one time where somebody shared that they had a past boss that how they walked in that morning everybody could tell what kind of day they were going to have Oh, and wow. I just don't believe that one person like that should impact and be in charge of everybody else's emotions. That's where emotion intelligence comes from is where it can say like, hey, I'm having a hard time right now. Text your significant other. Be like, I'm just going to decompress in the car for five minutes. I'm going to scream. I'm going to cry. I'm going to like rage to like heavy metal music, whatever, you know, whatever works for you. But let that be kind of the palate cleanser so you can come in and be refreshed because now it's time to take off that work hat and now put on your you know, parent hat, spouse hat, partner hat, any caregiver hat, like whatever it is that you are having to wear, but knowing, okay, now I'm in charge of my emotions. I'm not going to go dumping on everybody else. Right. I'm curious. I, I would think the same advice would follow, but you know, nowadays a lot of people work remote. That's a little bit harder to keep those boundaries in place because like now you work where you live, you live where you work. So what are, what are some, <clears throat> and I don't mean to throw you on the spot, but do you have any like suggestions or best practices to instill those, those boundaries? Like, you know, maybe you work for a little bit of a toxic company or a toxic team. Maybe there's like the leadership's a little unorganized, something like that. Like it, it can be dysregulating. And I do agree. Like it is your responsibility to ins like, instill those boundaries. Technically sure. Your supervisor should be making sure they're supervising and being the best version of themselves. But we know that doesn't happen. You always protect yourself. Right. So how can you do that when your, your live space and your workspace are one in the same? Yeah. And, and not everybody has a home office or a room that is dedicated to that. Yep. Um, I've talked to people who work at home in that capacity and her like, I work at my kitchen table or I have a desk set up in my room or something like that. And so I always try to say, you know, make sure that you kind of have a clear transition of a space. If for example, your office is in your bedroom, like maybe put up a partition that you can kind of like physically open and be like, business is closed right now, right? Because yeah. it's more, it's that energetic feeling of being like, my computer's over there, I know it's over there. But then also reminding yourself, oh, I am at home, I can step away for just a few minutes. It doesn't have to be, but we feel like, you know, because we are working at home, we have to be even more on or even more present or heaven forbid the slack shows that my mouse isn't moving and it says away right like we think that we're kind of being watched by the eyes in the skies and hopefully you're not necessarily but i know that there are a lot of like you said toxic workplaces where it's like people will micromanage that and you kind of have to really set those boundaries best you can right. utilizing your calendar to say like hey here i'm putting blocks of um, uninterrupted time, right? Like unless the company's on fire, please do not come to me. And it's also a practice too of teaching people how to treat you. And it's not always possible. You know, I always say everything with caveats, right? Yeah. Because sometimes if we're in a launch season, push season, if there's like promotions happening, promotional things happening, you sometimes do have to be all hands on deck. And then you know that. But when you're in kind of a, a, a normal season, normal in quotations, because what is that? Right. You know, it's being able to protect that space. But at home, reminding yourself, you know, when I was in the workplace, when I was working in office, I could never burn a candle, even though I love candles, because I want to be respectful to other people, because right. what I think might be a delightful scent might not be somebody else's delightful scent. So it's kind sure. of reminding yourself, hey, however you can make your space yours, if you're working from home, do that, you know, make it, make it a place that you actually enjoy. Make it a place that's fun. I have, a, I, I've talked to one guy and his home office, he loves everything Marvel, everything Star Wars. So he has a whole full display behind it and he can because it's his home office and he can do whatever he wants, right? Yeah. You can't necessarily bring that into the workplace. And so <laughs> I think it's opportunities to say, okay, I get, I'm working from home, but how do I make it a fun space that I really actually get to enjoy to come to? Um, and then reminding yourself it's okay to close the laptop. It's okay to take a step away. Go outside, breathe some fresh air because I think at home – it's almost worse. And I would love to hear like other people's opinions about that, but where, cause you really do feel like you're stuck and tethered to your computer 
because you don't have the external distractions. And I sometimes was like the worst of that in the workplace. I'm a very social person. So I would get done with my work and just like naively assume everybody else was done with theirs. Yep. And so I was like walking around to people. Um, and, and that's kind of part of the camaraderie that is in the workplace, which I think that's why a lot of companies are wanting people to get back together into the office. But I think there is a space to have a hybrid model or be like, yes. really, what is actually needed? Ask your people what they want. Don't just make demands of things necessarily, um, especially if it's been working. Right. Right. Yeah. So you don't have that natural distraction of, oh, so and so is coming here. Oh, we're going to chit chat. You don't have that nor those normal social interactions. So I feel like you are doing so much more computer work. And there is a such thing as Zoom fatigue. It's been studied, you know, having to sit in front of it's this so computer true. and just constantly be on and talk into the void is a big, actual, real thing. And so making sure that you're giving yourself those checks and balances at home and in the workplace. Boundaries, boundaries, boundaries. Stress management, which you Have agree them. is boundaries uh, to an extent. It's not all Absolutely. boundaries, but it is a big thing of boundaries. Uh, yeah, I'm always, yeah, it is. Boundaries. One of the things I do in my workshops with corporate groups is I have them kind of go through like a normal flow of their day. And again, normal in quotations. And I ask them, you know, as you think about the normal arc of your day, when do you tend to feel most stressed, overwhelmed, um, triggered by things and analyze that and then begin to put in those boundaries to play? Because if we can't do those things to kind of help offset some of it, well, then that's not helping us manage our stress. Right. And sometimes stress is inevitable and that's a guarantee, but it's how we manage it that makes all the difference. Right. Absolutely. I completely agree. Very well said. Very well said. So I'm just curious, do you ever use the term burnout in your teachings and trainings and workshops? Because I kind of feel like burnout is a result of, or it's one of the results of unmanaged stress and just kind of pushing yourself too hard for a lack of better words. I'm just curious what the expert's opinion is on that. Yeah. So kind of two parts. So um, I do address burnout, but I address it in kind of like a very real way because especially these days, burnout, that term is being tossed around very loosely, you know, mm -hmm. when if you know truly what burnout is on the clinical level, that is, you know, you're, you're no longer able to function in your work. You're no longer able to function in your life. And it is maybe one of those opportunities or those things where you have to go to um, a rehab center or a clinic just to be able to recoup from that. And that doesn't happen overnight. And burnout, that terminology is specifically right now for the workplace. They don't have it clinically um, described oh. as just, you can't be just burnout for, from life, but it is all things that are due to unmanaged stress, over workloads, understaffed, under resources, all of those things compounding. And that is what leads to burnout. There's five levels of burnout. And then there okay. is the ways that when we have chronic stress, so you just have your, you have your basic, you know, run of the mill stress. Um, and then you start to have chronic stress and that's the untapped because the body, I'm going to like get nerdy here for a second. So the body is designed to handle stress. Okay. That's why we have a nervous system. It is what kicks us into fight or flight. So ancestors come mountain lions come to attack. Are we fighting? Are we flying? It literally pumps blood to our extremities. Are we throwing punches? Are we kicking? Are we running? And it slows down our digestion. It actually slows down our immune system as well, because it's just going, Hey, we're needing to take care of the closest threat. Oh, wow. Well, what's happening now is that instead of mountain lions, it's mounting emails. That's my favorite dad joke puns. Um, but people are realizing that, you know, the, the, the mind doesn't know the difference between a perceived stress and then an actual stressor. And so, whereas we're supposed to close the loop, we're supposed to have that stressor, we engage, and then we come down from it. And when we come down from it and activate that parasympathetic system, our digestion actually enhances, our immune system enhances because it goes, okay, now we have to heal everything, right? Maybe we got injured in our battle with the mountain lion. We've got to, we've got to heal, we've got to do better. And so whereas that would typically engage when we don't close that loop, when we keep it open, 
That's what leads to chronic stress, which leads to actually a, suppress, a long-term suppressed immune system, gut health, um, emotional decline, mental decline. And that only continues that pathway. And so wow. that's the aspect of it that if we, from the science side and the actual, what is your body doing? That is what happens. And then it's even more complex when we get into our neurodivergent friends, right? And so how they process things is also going to be different. I, I joke all the time with my husband because I'm like, your head is telling you that you just like want to lay on the sofa and just like binge and consume and all this stuff, but you've really got to get out of your head and into your body. So it's doing those little checks and balances practices and be like, can I bring in some movement? Because we're getting filled with energy. We're getting filled with cortisol and all these stress hormones and it needs to come out. It needs to release somehow. We need to close that loop. And that might, for some people look like action for some people that might look like journaling for some people that might look like, you know, just doing gentle movement, maybe it's breath work, but it's doing something to help move and regulate the body. And that's the part that if we don't manage that, that leads to chronic stress. And the compounding chronic stress is what leads then to burnout. But I hear so many people, like I said, they, they wear it as a badge of honor. Oh, it's so burnout. I'm like, I don't want you to be burnout. No, I don't not. want you to get to we that should because be proud. nobody benefits you least as a person, least of all benefit. And I think the majority of us have people that we are either, you know, reliant to or have to take care of, whether it's pets or plants, right? We, we have things that we have to take care of um, if you're not taking care of people. And so you have to look after yourself first. And unfortunately, most aren't gonna have somebody who is like, hey, have you had any water? Have you gone to the bathroom? Have you stood up? Like, have you, have you breathed any fresh air? And, and that's just, you know, keeping it very like on dermis level. It goes so much deeper on truly oh, like sure. self-care and stress practices. So not meaning to make light of it, but just those right. little things that, you know, are touch points throughout the day that goes, oh, I can remember that I'm a human and I'm not just some robot who's at this thing. And, and kind of just remembering what you stand for, what, what you enjoy, what you like to do, and what, it was, what is the outcome that you're hoping for. Absolutely. And I was going to say, we say these are simple things, but I know I struggle with them sometimes. Also, neurodivergent girly over here, ADHD, hello. Yes. <laughs> um, and I'm like, yeah, it's just a struggle sometimes. But I mean, it's, I'm, I've definitely come a long way. I know it's something I have to work on probably the rest of my life, but we're in a good place. But Oh, it's an like, ongoing process. Trust me. I wish I wish there was a time where it was like, congratulations, here's your certification. You will never be stressed again. Thank you. Uh, unfortunately, they don't give those out. I've looked. But <laughs> it just, you know, it is what it is. And, and my one of my favorite sayings, I actually learned this saying from my teacher from yoga teacher training was just because something sounds simple doesn't mean it's easy. Oh, right? that is such a, a good simple rule. practices. Mm -hmm. There right. are a ton of simple practices that we can do, but that doesn't make them easy. And we don't, it's a good just one. like how you said, the brain can't dif differentiate between what is the actual stressor versus not. Like, it's the same thing. To me, like with my ADHD, I will think I can do the 32 things that I've outlined and I like process it in my head. And because I process it in my head, well, then obviously I can, I can do that. I can output that. No, like I probably do two of those things. But chances are, if there's 32 on there, I get immobilized because I'm at task paralysis and I'm like, Bleh. so sometimes stress management is just also like, knowing your limits like you cannot do it yeah now. because <laughs> exactly because then what happens you know you talk about not being able to get it done well then we start to shame spiral mm, and then yep. we're like why can't i just do the thing that i need to do and then we dig our hole deeper and deeper and deeper and <sighs> that's a long way out versus going how can i sometimes just do less is more right but it is hard when you're like, I have this long list of things I need to do. And then, you know, whether time is an issue for you, whether you as a neurodivergent person perceive time differently, right? <laughs> Where like you go into this time warp and you're like, I swear I had an hour. God why bless. is it, you know, why do I have to leave in five minutes? It's, it's reminding yourself, like, how can I set myself up for sex? I tell people it's very counterintuitive to what most leadership gurus, most successful people tell you, but I say sometimes go for the low hanging fruit. 
go for the things that's going to give you the win to help yes. propel you to the next thing. Because yes. otherwise, you, like I said, you make this long list, you don't get it done, you start to shame spiral, you start to have that inner voice of like, why can't I do it? Why do I even bother? And then it just sets you back versus going, okay, we're going to do this thing. In all my workshops, I tell people, because most of the rooms that I'm in are very high achieving, high performing, right? Like why yep. do one thing when you can do 20? And so when I do the goal setting, I say, I want you to pick one to two, no more than five. And let's break those down in workshops. And people are like, what? No, I want to have 15 goals. And I was like, but I want, I'm here to set you up for success. I want you to win. And we can only do that in small little increments, right? When you, when you get to one, then you can be like, I win. And then off to the next one. But we make it so overwhelming and make this huge thing versus how can I condense it and break it down so that way I have a positive outcome. So we're nicer to ourselves. Mm -hmm. Exactly. It's all about that inner narrative. The more I work on my anxiety, and my anxiety is in a really good place. I have my own mental health fun this is for lack of better words. Uh, I'm just kidding. There's a, that's the worst word to use. It was like my own, I call it my personal rock bottom. Everyone's rock bottoms are different. It was very unfun. <laughs> it was very empty and dark and isolating depression. And it was my first, it's been my most, ex, my, my main experience with it. And it, it does, it was taking down, breaking things smaller. I mean, at that point I wasn't taking care of myself. Like I wasn't showering. I wasn't eating. Like, I mean, I hated to even go use the bathroom. I was like, this is an inconvenience. That's how depressed I was. Yeah. And that's, that's that crazy. Is the depression. That's the burnout. That's the thing. That's like, you're getting there when you start to just eliminate all basic, you know, self-preservation. Yep. And that's, Ultimately, I mean, there was some health stuff. It was a car accident. It was a bunch of things, but it was a bunch of things yeah. that attributed to like unmanaged chronic stress. Well, chronic because it was over a period of few years. And then that was the yeah, outcome absolutely. was I was nothing. I had nothing. I was empty. But yeah. that's how I slowly crawled my way out was like, okay, all these big picture things like, honey, you're not even taking care of yourself. I was with a therapist and she was amazing. I am a big advocate for therapy, but it was like, you can't even worry about these big things. You need to like make sure you brush your teeth today. You need to like go use the bathroom and I feel guilty about taking a piss. I mean, TMI, yeah. but like that's where it was. And it's easier said than and done. I think but it's also important to put, yeah, to remind ourselves too, in those moments, which was your moment of just being in survival mode, mm -hmm. that sometimes those moments are needed too. Because that is your body just being like, we just have to take care of like what's happening right here. I don't have capacity for anything else. And yep. so I always like to put that caveat in there because I think that there are moments in life, things that happen, like it sounds like you had compounding things and sometimes life will just life like that. And survival mode is what is necessary because it's moving you through the day to get done just simply what you need to get done. Right. And so the, there's, there needs to be a lot of grace and forgiveness around those moments too. And just yes. being like, you know what, I did what I had to do in that moment, but it's the process of not staying in that moment. It's not exactly. staying in survival mode and being able to move past that. And that's where a lot of the tools come from being able to have the advocacy to help and bring people out of that. But also knowing that sometimes that's the season that you have to be in, 1, but you can't percent. stay there. I couldn't have said it better because I was going to say, as you were talking, I was thinking, not that I had to go through that to be where I am today, but going through that, I learned the tools to prevent that from happening again. I mean, knock on wood, I don't want to say never say never because like you said, life be lifing sometimes, but now mm -hmm. I have a whole set of skills, things, resources, but also just like knowledge and, and mental strength from, cause I have been at a rock bottom and I've got myself out. Did I do it by myself? No, like I had therapy, I, this, that, whatever. But like, I loved myself enough to get that help and to get out of that situation. And then now I have the mindset, the perspective, the tools to essentially, and the hope not to have it happen again. So yeah. survival mode, it, I'm sure I'll have moments, another, an, another periods, eras, chapters of survival mode, but hopefully I don't ever reach that rock bottom again because I, yeah. even when it gets dark or when it gets hard or overwhelming, I, I have that safety net. I have that, that life jacket that yeah, I can throw at the last minute. Practices. Exactly. Absolutely. Um, and the interesting part too, whenever I talk about stress per se, there is a lot of, 
a shame around it, I would yeah. say, because, you know, we think like, oh, well, so-and-so is handling it so much better. Why can't I handle it? Or this is nothing. Or I think we've also all thought where we're like, I don't understand why they're so stressed about it. I've been through that same thing and it wasn't that big of a deal. And I think that's where we have to remember everybody's capacity for stress is different because everybody's story is different. Yep. And so when we have those moments where we want to make judgments on others or judgments on ourselves, remembering that, you know, be present in that moment and you're not less than because you're struggling with stress. You're, you know, it doesn't take away from who you are. But remembering, okay, you do have practices that you can put in play to help manage this. Absolutely. Absolutely. Oh my gosh. I want to have you on speed dial just to like call you when I'm having a moment or a panic moment. And I'm just like, just walk me down. Just, <laughs> just breathe with me, please. Um, seriously. And, you know, I had wrote down how competing thoughts are overwhelming. And it's not even really a question. It's more of a statement. Like, yes, when your brain is going a, a thousand miles a minute and you're overwhelmed and you're stressed it's going to be a little bit harder probably to kind of find the fine mm -hmm. line or to find the light into the tunnel to get you out of whatever's going on. And that's where the grounding, the best practices, the toolkit that we're talking about, the resources, those will come in handy. But I, to me, I think I am ADHD, so I freaking know thoughts running amok is a problem I'm going to have the, my whole life. So it's just like, for me, it's like the awareness of knowing that, okay, that that's normal. That's no longer a something's wrong with me. That's just normal. And then it's like knowing yeah. it's normal. So that gives me that grace because I agree. Grace, guilt, shame or guilt and shame are heavily associated with stress. And those two yeah. emotions are so strong and they're so negative. And speaking from my own experience, like those have kept me in the gutter so much longer. But having this self-awareness, getting through those things, like when it's happening, OK, I'm a little dysregulated. How do we ground? I'm very sensitive to that now. Like, don't you dare dysregulate me, <laughs> especially if there was no reason yeah. to. Just being honest. Yeah, but. because it's so precious to you because you know what it feels like. And especially, you know, with my ADD and ADHD friends, it's like that duality of I need structure and then like, don't put me in a box, right? You like, are this one. And so it's like, okay, how? <laughs> There's my life. Right? Like, how do both <laughs> exist at the same time? <laughs> And so it's finding those little habits that that work for you. I will say my sister's also uh, ADHD, and she's done really good about putting things into play that work for her, mm -hmm. right? Tools and things that work for her. And it's funny that I have learned so much from her and from um, some other friends who are also ADD and ADHD. Simple things like uh, they jokingly call it the ADHD tax, right? Where you're like, I bought fresh vegetables and fresh fruits. And then I put them in my fridge never to be seen again. And so my sister, for example, is like, I know for myself, I have to pay more. So that's where like the tax comes in. I know I have to pay more to already buy pre-cut fruit because I'm not going to come home and cut up the strawberries or put the blueberries away or cut up the pineapple. It's just going to sit and rot. And now I have moldy pineapples or cantaloupes on my um, counter. And so it's like little things like that where you learn things about yourself, what supports you, what healthy habits can you get into and not just food healthy habits, but just life healthy habits that help create that structure, right. but also allow room for spontaneity. Exactly. Uh, for me, like you mentioned earlier about the low hanging fruit, and this kind of segues into like the last part of the conversation I want to have about bigger goals, breaking those down. But when you're talking about the low hanging fruit, and I was also thinking about the high achievers and all everything that you were saying. And for me with my ADHD, but not even just talk about ADHD, but like I have a full time job. Sure. Yes. But I'm trying to grow my podcast. I'm trying to get into speaking, as you know, because you've been such a great resource. But, like, that's a lot of different things. One, literally taking mental awareness of everything I'm doing. Believe it or not, I don't do. And I'm trying to work on that because I didn't realize how much that affects me. Like, actually recognizing how much you're doing. Because while I'm doing it, I'm not thinking about that. Because I think, oh, I don't have the volume numbers yet. I don't have this yet. I don't have that. But technically I'm trying to do three completely different things on top of my friends mm -hmm. and my husband and my family and like, you know, sleeping, eating. So it's overwhelming. Yeah. <laughs> so the mental awareness is so important, but also like being mindful of my tasks and making sure this is what I've started to do add in easy ones. Mm -hmm. I will purposefully add in easy yeah. ones because it's like a dopamine high to scratch something off because I went so long with not scratching things off because I was trying to do 5,000 things and that's not 
possible to do in one day. Even so, if you just have to write something on the list that you've already done just for the satisfaction of crossing do it. it off, right? Do it. And it, and, it. It's so, and it's so true. So especially with my mindfulness-based stress reduction training, it really helped, like, Mindfulness is already integrated in yoga teacher training, meditation. It's all kind of a part of the yamas and the niyamas and getting into the eight limbs of yoga and everything. But what I try to teach is like an undertone of mindfulness and essentially is mindfulness is being present on purpose, Love that. but without judgment. Right. So it's two, two hard parts, right? Two simple, but not easy parts. <laughs> Pay attention on purpose, being fully present, and then, you know, without the judgment. And so to the part where you're like, okay, we start off with expectations of wanting to be at a hundred already. We have to remember, okay, but we just got to start with step one right. and then step two and step three, and that we have to go through the steps. And as much as we just want it to be done and finished already, that's not how life works. And so that's the, the mental awareness that comes through of like, how can I do these tasks mindfully? It's not necessarily having to put in this whole new practice because whenever I bring up mindfulness or try to integrate mindfulness, I'm like, I know you're already trying to do everything you listed off, right? I'm trying to get enough sleep. I'm trying to do well my job. I'm trying to be a good partner. I'm trying to be a good, you know, daughter. I'm trying to like, you know, be a good friend. And when I'm like, yeah, but have you heard about mindfulness? They're like, Rosa, please. I'm already, no, stop. I'm I'm not journaling. I'm like Yeti full of water, right? Yeah. I don't (laughs) want to journal. I hate writing all the things. And, and so I tell people it's not this whole additional practice. It's an addition. It's a complementary thing to something that you're already doing. And when you give yourself small opportunities to be mindful, it allows you to see the full picture, I think, a little bit better. Yeah. And that can help succeed and, and show you the pathway to different goals because you can see, all right, this needs to take place. This needs to take place. This needs to take place. But because when we talk about goals, the, the thing that we want is the outcome, Right. Right. We're attached to that emotional feeling it's going to give me when I have achieved this. Right. And so that is what if we can hold on to that, that is what propels us and keeps us satiated through the goals because it's going to be hard. You're going to start and stop. You're going to have setbacks. You're going to have things that don't go the way that you want it to be. But how do you keep that feeling present? And that is what keeps us going. I'm an Enneagram eight and I'm jealous of all my ones and threes who like, (laughs) they're like, this goal, got it. I just want to go for it. Cause I'm like, I also, let's start off real strong. We're going to start off real strong together, but then I'm going to get a little tired along the way. I need that reinvigorating like multiple times throughout the way. I'm just as determined as you are, but and my timeline's a little different. And so I have to put checks and balances in for myself for this as well, but keep breaking it down. And then giving those moments of opportunity to be mindful throughout our day, it's just is so beneficial. And it helps to, you keep using the word grounding, which I really love. It helps to kind of keep you grounded in that. When things get overwhelming, just be where your feet are, because that's all you can do in that moment. You can't be anywhere else except for exactly where you are. And you say that, and despite what your brain is telling you, oh yeah, you can still do that. Because I don't know, with PTSD, mm-hmm. trauma, and the unmanaged stress, and maybe you haven't even made it to burnout, but you're on your way to burnout. Like everything in you is going to say, no, you don't have time. You can't do this. No, you can take the five minutes to breathe, Mm -hmm. to ground, to just exist. And I bet if you can do that just for five minutes in that chaos, you will come back more, more calm, more reserved, maybe not a hundred percent, but you're not going to be like this. Like if you breathe for five minutes and ground, if you come back like this, maybe you have a back issue. You know what I mean? Like, it's going to relax a little yeah. bit. It is. And it's interesting because when people notice the patterns, a lot of people will be like, oh, I'm laying in bed at night and that's when my brain starts going and all the ideas and all the things. I, or I'm in the shower. I get tons of my best ideas in the shower or I'm driving in the car and you know, you kind of disassociate and you get to where you are and you're like, eh, I don't remember that drive at all. That doesn't feel safe. How many stoplights? I don't know. Who knows? I'm just here. I that went from to here to here. More often than I'd and like. It, <laughs> Well, and the reason behind that, again, to kind of bring the science into it is because in those moments, you're not using your executive function. So your brain actually has the capacity to problem solve because it's kind of like, you know, when you're shoving something, it's not fitting, it's not fitting, it's not fitting. If you like back up for a little bit, maybe it's just like pivot like Ross from friends, (laughs) then things can kind of go up. But 
I tell people, you know, if you get your best ideas in moments of rest, because that's essentially what it is, that you're finally giving yourself a moment, what if you could do that intentionally? And that comes through mindfulness practices, that comes from through meditation practices. But when we don't do that, we are trying to lay in bed and we're getting, you know, all these downloads and all these analyzing of all the things that we said or could have said or fake arguments or future arguments that we're coming up with. And then that's when we feel that anxiousness start to creep in. And that's the perfect example of your brain not knowing the difference between a perceived threat and an actual threat, right? These things that are happening aren't actually happening right in front of you, but your brain is creating those scenarios and your body is activating as if those scenarios are actually happening. That's such a good call. And so you kind of have to give yourself the opportunity to be like, okay, where can I give myself five to 10 minutes? It doesn't have to be a full 30 minutes. It doesn't have to be a full ritualistic practice. It can just be as simple as I'm going to sit here. I'm going to put my hands on the table. I'm going to close my eyes or soften my gaze. And I'm just going to breathe in through my nose and out through my mouth five times. And then let that be. It can be But those little touch points throughout the day, it can be just as small like that, but very impactful. I always tell people something is better than nothing. Your body's going to benefit. All of what you're saying, what we're talking about, like that is all of the, the mentality, the mindset, the tools that you take to break down larger projects, dreams, ambitions, whatever, into smaller tasks to make them attainable. I feel like, because it can be overwhelming, right? Like if you want to build a house, you're not just going to go build the house that day. Like you got to clear the land. You got to make sure the land's level. Then you got to establish the foundation. Then you got to make sure the foundation's solid. There's no cracks in the foundation. Then you start to build the framework. Like you don't start with the roof. You don't start with the windows. You got to build it. And like as somebody who has, like and my the- podcast was a huge dream. So it, was, it took me, yeah. I had to get through my mental shit and my mental health, whatever, uh, whatever, my mental health journey to be able to be in a, a space to do it. And I didn't realize that I was in such a bad place mentally, but like my brain was like, you're less than cause you haven't started this thing. My brain wasn't noticing, Oh, like we're not okay. It was just like what I wasn't doing. And I was mm-hmm. able to do the podcast once I was okay. Once I was grounded, I'd got my foundation right. And then you just, you build on. And I mean, when I launched this, was I hundred percent? No, I was probably more like 75, 70%. I am, I am now a hundred percent. Like you just, you get better yeah. at it, I feel like, but you, you can't... start, you start imperfectly yes. and you all the, cause we can, you know, have excuses until the cows come home, Right. but it's the thing where it's like, okay, can I get it mostly there and then start and then figure it out along the way. That has been one of the biggest lessons I have learned along my life's journey is that everything is made up. Most yes. people like they're fairly decent at what they're doing, but they're figuring out along the way numbers aren't real, nothing's real, right? If we want to get to an existential crisis oh. um, <laughs> journey. So, but it is one of those things where it's like you can get out of your head a little bit and be like, I'm figuring it out just like everybody else is. It's like everybody had to start from someplace. And I have learned so much of that from having my daughter. She is a beautiful practice of reminders of mindfulness because she, a little new human, right? She's literally learning everything for the first time. And the awe that I see in her sometimes is just so inspiring because she'll be fascinated by a dead bug, right on the ground or a blade of grass or the way that the clouds are drifting through the sky. And it's those really sweet moments where I can be like, wow, those clouds actually are really pretty. And we would get to have those connection moments, but how often do we actually get to sit and look and just be in awe of things around us? And kids are so good for dogs are also so good for that. Yes. To be able to just like bring us down to those moments that we forget that we're allowed to stop and truly smell the roses anytime we want, but we're always in a hurry. And what are we constantly rushing for? Right. We got one life. Talk about being existential. We got one life. Like stop and smell the roses. Be at peace. Set those big dreams. Go after them, but enjoy the journey. Yes. Yes. Because you're going to get there. You've already dreamed it. Claim it. Just trust you're going to get there. 
That's that's definitely something that yeah, guides And your house analogy was very poignant since I'm literally in the middle of that right now. <laughs> so I was like, yes, all the things. You do have to do all the things. But I have this vision and this like, you know, this drawing of what this house is going to look like when it's all done. And then through any week, I go through multiple highs and lows of being like, I can do it. I'm my best cheerleader. And being like, I'm this isn't going to work. There's not going to be an, we're just going to run out of money. And we're like, people are going to do the thing, you know, and. And it's sitting with those feelings and kind of going through them and be like, nope, just control what you can control. And we just, we push on. And I want to say this, fun fact, everybody listening who may be struggling with stress, chronic stress, intrusive thoughts, because that's definitely a friend of unmanaged stress, intrusion, intrusive thoughts. Mm -hmm. Believe it or not, and I'm saying this as somebody who never would have thought this could happen. But the more you work on everything that Rosa and I have talked about, but definitely what Rosa has shared Believe it or not, your inner narrative will become more positive. Believe it or not, mm -hmm. you won't have as much imposter syndrome. Believe it or not, when those things happen, you can snap out of it before your body can even catch up. So I promise you, yeah. you may be hearing this going, I can't do that. There's no way. I can't. I cannot stop and smell the roses. Like I can't even like see the roses. I'm going so fast. I promise you, you can. It does take effort, yeah. but it is a fight. It is an effort that's worth it because the amount of mental peace I have found is amazing and guess what with it i have been able to accomplish tenfold what i could have before yeah and it's called a practice for a reason yep. right and it is it's a continuous journey i recently got to um lead part of a workshop that was goal setting and it was just a very quick like 15 minute practice where we had our goal we wrote down our all of our things and then i had them turn to the person next to them and share it but share it in as a way as if i've they've already accomplished it, right? Like, Ooh, I love for that. example, I have already, I've already built my house. I've already built my dream house and the energy in the room, you could feel it truly rise. And then I kind of brought them back to it because I was seeing everybody being like, yeah, girl, you do it. Like you got this, you know, like very encouraging. And I brought them back to it and said, you know, as encouraging as you were to this stranger, I want you to flip it and think about your own goal here and how do you speak to yourself about this goal? Because you would not have told this stranger, that's a dumb idea, like right. you're never gonna do that, or well, maybe good good luck, I'm sure you'll start, but you won't finish it, right? All the things that we go on in our head, we would never say that to them, but we have that internal dialogue <laughs> and so much more. I joke with people, it's really hard to hurt my feelings because I'm very good at hurting my own. And so <laughs> how, do you, how do we manage that, right? Because right. the way that we talk about ourselves, our body listens. If you're not gonna say it to friends, if you're not gonna say it to people that you care about, don't say it to yourself because you need to love yourself and care for yourself. And and think of some, somebody um, once shared this practice where they were like, they pretended that they were talking to their 10-year-old version. Like, would you say that to 10-year-old you? And you're like, absolutely not, right? Not. As your adult version, you would be encouraging, you would be loving. And it's a reminder to do it to yourself. And then when you notice those negative thought patterns that come through, honoring them and saying like, Haha, thank you so much. Um, I see what you're doing. And uh, I'm not here for it and kind of try to put that kibosh on it and just rewire some of that. Right. And so when we say like, I, I'll never be able to do this, right. It'd be like, well, I ha I'm not able to do it yet. Or I have these things that I have to learn along the way. And so it's kind of reframing it that puts a positive twist on it, but still honoring those, those thoughts because they're always going to be with us, right. right? They're allowed to be along the, in the car with us, but you're in the control, you're in the driver's seat. And if they get too loud, maybe you got to put them in the back seat, play quiet mouse for a little bit, but they're still going to be there. And so it's just having that self-awareness of when we start to go down that negative thought pattern. This is a reminder that you do have the control. Even if you're like reorganizing the thoughts, you can do it. Mm. That was such mm -hmm. a great note to end on. And I was going to say this, I just did an episode like uh, two weeks ago, I think that was about this. Cause I did an exercise with one of my friends and it was like a positive affirmation kind of self-talk uh, exercise. And I got emotional because sure. I think these things mm -hmm. here and there like, Oh, you're, you're working hard. But it's like being so specific in the, accolade in the positive talk just yeah. being so specific like you like you hit it the compliment you give the stranger giving it to yourself there is so much power in that and i mean 
as somebody who has come through so much shit and like worked on myself, like it's, I, I'm just like, wow, I'm always learning new things. Cause like, sure I can manage this or I can, when I'm feeling a certain way, I can like gauge up, oh, I'm hitting my limit. And I'm not saying I, I stop mm-hmm. always. Sometimes I, I accidentally pass go, skip go. And I keep going straight to jail mm-hmm. kind of thing. But Giving yourself the compliment that you would give a stranger, that you would give your 10-year-old self, I think is the best piece of advice. That is so important. Yeah. And, and sometimes, too, it'll even feel like you're lying to yourself yes. right? because your body feels like it'll reject it. But it's yep. like, nope, because your body will be like, mm, I don't think you, you and I both, you know that I know that you know it's not true, right? And so you have to be like, yes, but we are, we are working through this. And that is, that's part of it. So when, when you feel that rejection, ah, you know what? I got it. But guess what? We are good enough. We did do this one thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, hell just catch yourself that you caught yourself in the thought. Like that is the call out because to me, all those little things add up. It may sound exhausting and I don't mean for it to be exhausting. You're not always like on guard in your head, but you know what I mean? Like it is, it is worth the call out. It is, that is so powerful. Mm So Man, I can only imagine like the workshops and, and, and activations and all the things that you do. Like everyone leaves like on a high afterward. Just like, wow, I'm going to go take over the world. <laughs> that Gosh. happy tears, sad tears, all the feelings. <laughs> yep. Yep. Um, but yeah. I love that. So my last very question before we kick, we kick things off. <laughs> Wrong end of the episode, Liz. Before we close things out. Kick me out. <laughs> <laughs> goodness um Freudian slip she's like we're done here we're done <laughs> goodbye end recording <laughs> um yes. sorry you've reached my voicemail no I'm just kidding what <laughs> is I mean you've given so much advice but what is a piece of advice that you live by to manage your stress if that's even possible like to summarize yeah the number one well I guess kind of two is that stress and chaos are inevitable okay and it helps because when you can kind of expect things and when you can kind of be like, I know things are going to happen. It helped being not caught off guard as much when you're like, it's just life, stress, chaos. It's, it's inevitable. Things are going to happen. Life is going to life. Like we said earlier, but having that awareness that it's, you know, this is it's not to contradict myself, but you know, that not everything is always sunshine and rainbows, but it, it, there's so much good, but there is stress, there's chaos and that's going to happen. And so that's kind of one of the rules or one of the things that I'm like, you know, it's going to do it. Let's roll with the punches. And then the second thing that is so important that I don't feel like nearly enough people do that I do for myself is just like companies have mission statements and core values, define those for yourself. Because if you don't have your North Star, it's really easy to get off your path to shiny object syndrome. And so I created three for myself that really helped me stay on track, help me make decisions. So when things do come up, I can say this is a hell yes or this is a hell no. And my three are family freedom and flexibility, make a shit ton of money and do good in the world. I love that. And so was opportunities come up as I navigate through my life, they have to kind of be in one of those things and people don't give themselves the opportunity to sit and be like, what do I really stand for? What do I really believe? How do I want to navigate throughout life? And I think it's just makes things so much easier. That's why companies have them, right? right? So if somebody goes, this company, what do they stand for? Who are they? It can be like, Oh, it's right here. Right. And so having something like that defined for yourself, I think is going to be one of the best things that helps really manage that stress because you can see what things align with this, what things do I maybe maybe need to let go of that aren't aligning with my own personal core values. What am I saying yes to that I just said yes to, but I really don't want to do this. It doesn't bring me joy. It actually mm-hmm. like is a much more sh- bigger stressor than, you know, what I wanted it to be. And then kind of allow life to flow that way. I love that. All right, everybody. So now we're going to, once we're done, you're done listening to this episode, we're all going to go home and we're going to write down our core values. Cause, uh, yeah, Yeah, like make your core values, do it with your family too, because I think you should have your own, you should have your own personal goals or or your own personal core values. And then I feel like as a family unit to have them as well. So I, I agree. I, I mean, cause the whole Testament behind why you'd have them. I have a really great digital workshop, not to like plug, but I'm going to plug called the line and achieve it's goal setting and vision boarding. But uh, one of the practices is going through and helping to set your mission statements, set your core values, and then do what is my personal favorite. One of my favorites is a wheel of life to be like, 
do just check in where you are. Where do you want to be? Where do you need to scale up? Where do you need to scale back? Scaling back's my oh. favorite. And so it kind of just brings people through a self-guided journey. Okay, so we'll make sure that we link that in the show notes. Is that on your website? That's my shame. That's my shameless plug. <laughs> no, I love it. So, is that on your website? If uh, send me the link so I can make sure I can check it out. I'll personally. send you the link because it's buried because I do a lot of my own stuff and so you know I don't do it all properly. <laughs> I bet it, I mean, your website's beautiful. It's, it's, in, it's in there somewhere, but I'll send you the direct link just to make life easier. Please do. Please do. Uh, Va, that was a yeah. wonderful note to end on. Thank you so much, Rosa. This has been so encouraging and just, I mean, it's all things that I'm passionate about, but it's, it's just, it's good to hear. Like I, the core values, I definitely want to go assess that. It makes sense. Like the CEO of you, like, what do you stand for? Yeah. And like no more survival mode, like fight or flight. There's a reason for that, but not everything is surrounded by mountain lions. So that's just right. something to kind of close the loop, close the loop. I love that. Oh my gosh. You're amazing. <laughs> uh, thank you so much for having me. This was so fun. I feel like this could be like 15 hours long if we really, Oh, for sure. It's like it a 15 be. part series. Let's do it, please. I'm like, okay, so now let's get into we're goal setting. We'll put on a retreat so everybody can just hear us talk. Yeah. So you thought this episode was over, but now we're getting into goal setting. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, and vision board planning is next. Uh, I love it. So Yay. where could everyone find you if they wanted to come, you know, check you out and follow for best practices and, and feedback and things like that? Yes. So I love to connect on my Instagram, which is just wellbeing with Rosa. Cute. And uh, it's kind of scattered because, you know, I <laughs> why well, have a perfectly curated page when you could just have all sorts of spontaneous things that Welcome you just feel like me. posting. <laughs> I'm the same way. And then <laughs> from the work, yeah, from the workplace point of view, it's a workplace stress solutions dot co. Love it. So any of my, my corporate girlies listening who are leaders, we all know that y'all need that in your corporate structure. So call your girl Rosa because clearly she knows what she's saying. I love it. Oh, yes. Yes. Amazing. And if any interest in having me speak on anything, just rosacastano.com. Really make it easy. But we'll put all that, I'm sure, in the show notes because that's a lot of stuff to keep track of. <laughs> no, you need to memorize it right now. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Right oh, now. Goodness. Exactly. Pull it up on your tab. I'm obsessed. Well, everyone listening, you can watch this episode on YouTube at the In Between Podcast. You can hear it wherever you get your podcast. Because if you're listening to it, clearly you're 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 listening to it. And then you can follow me at in dot between pod and Elizabeth Cheney underscore on Instagram. And you'll find me and Rosa just hanging out, you know, building houses and yeah, pretty much killing stress because that's the way the cookie crumbles. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness! Well, there we go. Next time. Until our our 15 part web series, I guess I will. I'll let you go, and I'll see you next time. <laughs> <laughs> See you next time. Thank you. Bye.